This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hello and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii and it never got quiet. This is a half hour program that explores the Hawaiian connection with the Vietnam War. I'm your host Vic Kraft. This is our third program we've already received uh, constructive comments on and that has uh, been reviewed and taken into consideration. We hope to improve with each new episode. The intention of this program was to share the experiences of Hawaiian veterans of the Vietnam War. In the questioning of our guests, we did not want to probe so deep where they would bear their souls. However, we left it up to them as to how much they wanted to share by asking questions that would allow them to take it to the next step as they saw fit. War is a very personal experience, each of us dealing with it in our own way. It is difficult to share with those who have not experienced war. A lot of veterans may feel ashamed at sharing such personal feelings and don't even recognize that they are carrying such emotions. Many keep those feelings locked up inside, some manifesting themselves having potentially destructive consequences. One of the reasons for us older guys to come out and tell our stories was to help our younger veterans of the Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts. They, like us when we were 19 or 20, are 12 feet tall and made of steel. In other words, indestructible. Time has proved otherwise. None of us are case hardened and we are not capable of being objective when it comes to how we behave. We have been through a traumatic event. It has affected us. I am reminded of a story Aaron Sorkin wrote for an episode of West Wing. This guy is walking down the street when he falls in a hole. The walls are so steep he can't get out. A doctor passes by and the guy shouts up, hey, can you help me out? The doctor writes a prescription, throws it down in the hole and moves on. Then a priest comes along and the guy shouts up, father, I'm down in this hole, can you help me out? The priest writes out a prayer, throws it down in the hole and moves on. Then a friend walks by, hey Joe, it's me, can you help me out? And the friend jumps in the hole. Our guy says, are you stupid? Now we're both down here. The friend says, yeah, but I've been down here before and I know the way out. The problems we as Vietnam veterans have had over the last 40 or 50 years could possibly have been mitigated if we had had some mentors to guide us. One of the comments we received from, was from an Iraqi war veteran who after seeing our program said those guys, meaning our veteran guests, were successful in their lives because they didn't have to deal with the PTSD we have. Believe me, we have had to deal with alcohol and drug addiction, broken marriages, the inability to keep a job, socialization issues when dealing with others, especially non-veterans. The Veterans Administration statistics still places 18 to 22 veterans su uh, committing suicide each day. We've been down that hole before, but we know the way out. Our guest today is Gary Serra. Gary joined the Marine Corps in 1967. He was trained as a tank crew member and was shipped to Vietnam just before the 1968 Tet Offensive. But as all Marines know, your primary MOS or military occupation specialty is, an, is as an infantryman. Gary didn't get to see a tank for a few months after arriving in country and was placed in an infantry battalion. Later, after being assigned to a tank company, he was injured and sent back to the States. After discharge from the Marines, Gary held a few jobs before enlisting in the Hawaii Air Guard. He spent over 30 years in the Air National Guard and has since retired to his hobbies. He does volunteer work at Kalialoa Park, their Heritage Park, and has also found another avenue in his life, and we'll talk about that, and that has turned into his new passion. Welcome in Gary, uh, and aloha, Gary. Thank you. Glad to be here. I'm glad you are here. <laughs> Given the reputation that the Marines have, 
what caused you to go into the core right after high school? You know, uh, many times I've been asked that question, Vic. And uh, there's two actually uh, things that uh, caused me to join the Marines. One was uh, my oldest brother uh, tried to get in the Marines into the aviation force. And he failed to do that, so he decided to join the Air Force. But during the meantime, I was still going to high school. And uh, during that time period, my older sister joined the Army. And also my brother, my older brother, uh, second brother, uh, joined the Navy. So now I had a brother in the Air Force, I had a sister in the Army, and I had a brother in the uh, Navy. So as you, as you well know, just like every family, you know, uh, they come back home and they have stories to talk about and stories to share with the families. Well, being that my sister, brother, and my other brother been in the other three uh, armed forces, I decided to join the Marine Corps because I didn't want to bring back the same stories that they shared with me. <laughs> so that was, that was kind of interesting. And uh, I, I kind of knew what I was getting into, but you know, it, it boils down to the point where I didn't want to repeat the same stories. <laughs> Speaking of that, did you have a choice in the, the jobs that you were going to get uh, when you went into the Corps, or uh, you were just thrown into the, the occupational specialty that you had? Well, you know, all of us uh, recruits didn't get to find out wh what specialty or MOS that we were going to into, and not until the day after graduation. And among us, the story goes around saying that the way we get selected as far as the specialty that we are assigned to is by them throwing darts. And I was lucky enough that my dart landed on 1811 because a lot of people, uh, a lot of the uh, recruits was concerned about being in the infantry. And as you well know, sure. you know that's the primary thing with the, with the Marines or any uh, forces. Correct. Yeah. Well, you didn't really have a whole lot of time to socialize because I know that uh, you did Marine, Marine uh, Recruit Depot in San Diego. Correct. Uh, then did Infantry Training Regiment, uh, probably at Pendleton. Yes. And then uh, thrown into uh, tank school right there uh, outside of Oceanside. And so uh, you were a pretty busy guy uh, all this time. Didn't get a chance to get out and see the, uh, the pleasures of the mainland, I would assume. No, I, I haven't. Uh, it's very few times, even during the uh, times that we have on uh, Liberty Call, you know, uh, we're restricted as far as the distance that we travel. So, you know, just the nearby uh, towns that we were able to visit and spend time with. But then again, uh, it wasn't an intermingling with, uh, with the, uh, the residents there. It was more as a group effort from the uh, Marine Corps. Did you find it as a culture shock at all? I mean, uh, you know, uh, coming from the islands, uh, going into San Diego was... Uh, you know, here's this big city uh, by comparison. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't really find it as a culture shock. Maybe it was, but you know, thinking back then, uh, I didn't see it as a culture shock. The only thing I knew that I would have to change. I would have to adjust myself as far as uh, being uh, involved in, in, in the new environment. Mm -hmm. You know, because here at home, of course, we we speak English. I mean, a pigeon. So, knowing well that uh, the people that I encounter don't understand pigeon. So that was, in a sense, a difficult transition. Yeah, yeah I was thinking uh, you came from the Big Island uh, and uh, raised down there in uh, Hilo, Kona, and then uh, subsequently moved, your family moved up to uh, Waipahu. And uh, you've- Wahiwa. Wahiwa, Wahiwa sorry, uh, Wahiwa. And uh, uh, graduated from school there and uh, and went right into the Corps. And as you said, uh, you told me that you had enlisted before you even graduated uh, from high school. So, uh, I mean, there must have been some motivation there as far as, uh, was there a sense of service or was it just you wanted to show your, your siblings off? <laughs> uh, the reason why I, I chose to join the Marines or the service right after high school was the fact that uh, I knew uh, that eventually I would have been drafted. However, my mom or my parents at that time uh, wanted me to uh, wanted me to uh, go to school and continue mm -hmm. my education. Uh, but I told them that uh, being that I'm going to be drafted anyway, uh, to go to school and later on beco become drafted, then say I die overseas because I knew I was going to go to Vietnam. Uh, so the chances of me dying there, possibility. 
So returning then, uh, if I don't return then, then the money invested in me, going, you know, for education is like wasted. So I, I told my parents that I'm going to join the service and get it over with. And whatever happens after that, then we'll take it from that point. Hmm. Well, not necessarily fatalistic, but realistic as far as a return on investment. <laughs> uh, good business sense, I would imagine. Uh, your experience in combat, uh, I know that uh, you uh, didn't go into tanks right away. Uh, you were shipped out, uh, went into Da Nang, and I guess uh, were put in a replacement battalion or unit and then uh, farmed out to various other units. Uh, I, I think you said that you had maintained contact with the group that you were with, a bunch of tankers. Correct. And you ended up in uh, an infantry unit, uh, basically uh, uh, performing uh, security duties. Right. And uh, I, I'd imagine getting shipped out into the boonies, it had to have been some kind of a, uh, a traumatic experience, <laughs> knowing that you're going into what we used to call Indian country. <clears throat> Correct. Uh, you're right. Uh, you know, uh, when I first went overseas, my thinking is that once I get in country, I'd be assigned to a tank unit. Well, obviously, it, it didn't happen. I, I spent about four months, uh, first four months in country, being uh, an infantryman. <coughs> however, however, this uh, company that we we're assigned to was uh, uh, consists of all different specialty specialists, and uh, we were held there for the purpose of finding out a unit that is available that we can be assigned to. Hmm. But during the four months period, uh, uh, as much as we were trying to get assigned to a tank unit, the word came back that you know the tank unit was all filled with uh, personnel, so it wasn't uh, any availability for us to be assigned to a tank unit. Hmm. We'll get back to that uh, in just a minute, Gary. Uh, for the moment, let's just take a break here, and uh, hmm. we'll get back with Gary Sarah in just a few moments. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. But I have a story, and I don't know where to start. I feel alone in a crowd. I can't sleep. I feel overwhelmed. I don't even know who I am anymore. I still have nightmares. I can't live like this anymore. I'm really not so good. But are you ready to listen? I'm Helen Dora Hyden, the host of Voice of the Veteran, seen here live every Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. As a fellow veteran and veterans advocate with over 23 years experience serving veterans, active duty, and family members, I hope to educate everyone on benefits and accessibility services by inviting professionals in the field to appear on the show. In addition, I hope to plan on inviting guest veterans to talk about their concerns and possibly offer solutions. As we navigate and work together through issues, we can all benefit. Please join me every Thursday at 1 p.m. for the Voice of the Veteran. Aloha! Thank you and welcome back to It Never Got Quiet. We're here with Gary Serra and uh, we were just talking about uh, the beginnings of his experiences uh, in country in Vietnam. And uh, I have a question for you regarding that, Gary. Do you think your experiences in combat affected you in any way, or you're just a normal guy, or uh, did it impact your life in any way that you know of? Uh, you know, it's a good question. Uh, you know, when I was overseas uh, in country, uh, never dawned on me as far as the impact that it would have on my life after I leave the country, uh, because. Uh, my primary uh, concern at that time was surviving. So when I left the country, uh, looking back now or looking back then, I, there, there was no impact that I, I noticed within myself. So I would say, no, not really. Well, it's interesting because we both belong to uh, the West Oahu Vet Center uh, group uh, that meets uh, regularly, and uh, we we have found kind of a place where we can sit and talk story and uh, relate to one another. But uh, one of the things that we have discovered is that we can communicate with each other where we couldn't communicate with other people. Sure. And something must have motivated you to come 
to the group at some point in time. Uh, I know that uh, Ed DeGuzman talked me into doing it, and uh, I was very thankful that he did because I've met a, a marvelous group of people, plus uh, gotten involved in some of the activities that the Vet Center offers. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll get, get into that in a minute, because uh, that's uh, one of the things that uh, I think has really been great as far as helping both of us. Uh, and that is uh, we've w uh, picked up uh, a martial art, but it's really more of a philosophy, and that's uh, Ki Aikido. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that attracted me to it mostly was because in Ki Aikido, uh, the primary, or one of the primary parts of the philosophy is to keep your opponent from hurting themselves. And I thought that was very different from any of the other martial arts where you're basically trying to beat somebody's brains out. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do this, uh, and, and we keep continuing to learn and as part of that fellowship that we have gained. And I know that uh, in terms of transitioning, you know, getting out of the Corps, when you left combat, you came back to the States and were discharged uh, after you had done just a little more time uh, being an instructor. But you got out, came back to Hawaii, uh, and what were you looking for at that time? You know, when I got out of the service, I was 21 years old. Uh, when I came home, I was still dependent on my parents. And I decided to come home, although I tried to make a, a living in California, up in San, San Francisco. But I realized that uh, my parents wanted me back home. They wanted someone back home because uh, there was no one there uh, helping them out. So I decided to come home. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started doing various things. But the transition uh, you know, to civilian life uh, really didn't impact me in regards to my service. Mm -hmm. uh, my focus was just to do my civil duties, become again a, civ a civilian, finding a job, you know, getting paid, and enjoying the comforts of home. So that was the, the, the main thing. Uh, life for me at that time wasn't, I didn't take it as serious until my mom passed. After my mom passed, then life became serious for me. Then I really had to look at my career, my future, because it was all dependent on myself. Mm -hmm. So you uh, ended up uh, in the Hawaii Air Guard, and I think uh, well, it was it your brother that talked mm -hmm. you into it, uh, just as a, as a weekend warrior, and then ended up as a full-time uh, technician there. And uh, uh, again, thank you for your service there, too. Uh, yeah, thank you. But uh, it's, uh, it must have been an interesting experience, 30-some years uh, in the Guard, uh, you transitioned through uh, several different uh, aircraft systems and having to relearn those uh, or, or learn new aircraft systems and new ways of management. But one of the things that I, I noticed in our conversations and knowing you is that you always had something beyond that. You had your job, but as one person said it, asked me a question, said, what's your work? You had something else that you could go to besides your work. And I know that when you retired, now you, it was kind of, well, great, now I can devote most of my time or all my time mm. uh, to this hobby. And uh, I know that you do car restoration, uh, amongst other things, as well as volunteer work at uh, Kalealoa Heritage Park. And uh, I know that uh, your sense of curiosity got you as to why we did Aikido uh, at the Vet Center, and yet, uh, it became such a passion with you uh, that you have become our senpai in our group. And uh, I, I thought that that was marvelous, that uh, you're now our teacher. Uh, how did Aikido affect you? I mean, it just, what was the attraction there? Well, initially, uh, the attraction was martial arts. Mm -hmm. At that time, I was looking for a martial arts, but something that wasn't extensive like Karate, Judo, uh, Kendo, uh, Taekwondo. Then this came up, and, and I wasn't familiar with Ki Aikido. So that was my uh, curiosity. And that's the reason why at the Vet Center I got myself involved in that program. Oh. But uh, so you, you went beyond that, just being a participant. 
I went beyond that because I realized uh, there was more to uh, Ki Aikido, uh, the martial arts part of it. Uh, and it's more uh, uh, personal mm -hmm. as far as individuals uh, and knowing oneself better. You know, uh, that's what Ki Aikido for me uh, provides, knowing myself better. You know, knowing my, my limitations, you know, knowing that uh, I'm the one that creates things for myself and no one else. And to continue that, uh, I figured, well, I, there's more to it than this. And there is more. And I haven't really learned everything about it. That's an interesting observation because uh, one of the things that we've learned in Aikido is you never stop learning. Uh, but you also uh, bring up a point that I find interesting, and that is having goals. Uh, we talked about it before as far as uh, your transitioning from uh, military life uh, to civilian life and, be, and, and providing uh, a job or, or something, and keeping a roof over your head. But there was still something more that you wanted, and you, you went ahead and uh, joined the service again, essentially did 30-some years, which I think is remarkable. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when you transitioned from there, it was not a problem. And so many retirees, uh, I think the statistics show that uh, you have uh, people that are dying from health problems or suicide within five years uh, after retiring, uh, which is a heck of a statistic. And uh, I know that you've been uh, retired for quite some time, uh, but you didn't see the military as being the end of your life. You had something else. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, to answer this young guy's question as far as the Iraqi war veterans, uh, the PTSD aspect of it, I, I think that uh, in, in conversations with you and also uh, conversations with a friend of mine who's a psychologist uh, up in Alberta, uh, a lot of people, when they have that loss of purpose, become desperate. And you seem to have maintained that. Uh, you had that purpose even though you didn't have a job. You had a hobby. And uh, I know that you've done an awful lot of cars. And uh, you know, your restoration uh, skills are, are remarkable. Uh, how did you end up doing that? I mean, I mean is this something that you felt good about? Uh, it, it all started because of uh, my previous jobs that I had. <coughs> uh, prior to the, uh, my time in the uh, Air Guard, uh, there were other jobs that I, I uh, were doing. And one of them was, uh, had a lot to do with uh, automotive, you know. And uh, I've, I've learned a lot. And, it, and I found out that the, what I was learning or what they were showing me or teaching me and making me do was very interesting. So I kind of carried that on. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, just to kind of change the direction here a little bit. What would you like people to remember about us in the Vietnam War? About us in the Vietnam War. I think uh, for me, uh, it's that the people hope that people would understand uh, that we were put there and all the men, women that participated in that conflict did their best. And, and that's the bottom line. And no more. Just doing the best. Interesting uh, observation. Uh, and, I, and I hope that uh, our Iraq and uh, Afghanistan veterans feel the same way, that uh, they uh, have done their best. We'd love to have some feedback. We're also looking for people to interview. If you have some comments or would like to appear on the program, please send us an email at 808vietnamvets at gmail.com. I would like to thank the staff here at Think Tech Hawaii for all their support and assistance. Truly without them, this program would not be possible. If you would like more information on the Kalealoa Heritage Park, please go to their website, uh, www.khlfoundation.org. And once again, I would like to thank Gary Sarah for being with us on this program. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>